Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our first LEC seminar back in person. And I think over two years, um, our seminar series this year will be live streamed on YouTube. So if you're unable to make it in person, you can watch the live stream afterwards or from your office. And just some housekeeping notes, there will be a reception after this talk outside of Bayer Hall. And even if you watch in your office, we encourage you to come down to that reception uh, because it will be outside. Next week, we're going to hear from Dr. Stella Udewal, who will talk about diet and foraging in a community of generalist predators and wolf, specifically wolf spiders. And then it is my pleasure to introduce my friend, John Grady, a new postdoctoral fellow for the Living Earth Collaborative. He's working with Washington University neuroscientist Keith Hagen, Hagen? Uh, and a movement ecologist, Anthony Dell, from the National Great Rivers Research and Ed Education Center. John received his PhD from the University of New Mexico under the direction of Felicia Smith and Jim Brown. His research lies at the intersection of physiology and global diversity with a focus on vertebrates, especially the charismatic ones. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Brady. Hey, thanks so much for coming out here. Let me get my um, this thing is on more or less. Can everyone hear me? Okay, that's the important thing. Well, I'm going to take you a little tour through a lot of charismatic megafauna. And I'm trying to make an argument that if we look at metabolic differences, these can predict a lot of species interactions and ultimately scale up, predict patterns of diversity. So, First things first, let's define our terms. What do I mean by metabolism, metabolic rates, and metabolic power? Um, so metabolism are all the chemical reactions that sustain life. So it's warned against uh, using a uh, red dot thing, laser pointer. Uh, so I'm gonna just kind of directionally point, but we eat food, and we ultimately use that chemical bond energy between hydrogens and carbons that are in all your food and convert that into uh, energy source, ATP. And we use oxygen as we're doing that. And that ATP or GTP powers virtually all of the chemical reactions in our body. So every metabolic pathway in here uh, is ultimately powered by breaking down food into ATP. So we can get a, a measure of the total amount of metabolic reactions by looking at oxygen consumption. And these metabolic reactions uh, appear, ultimately give rise to organismal processes, so such as movement. And so muscles contract and limbs move. And then that in turn affects ecological in, in, uh, interactions such as predation. Um, and then there's kind of a full loop where you eat your food or you pull resources from the ground and the process repeats itself. So let me try to start my timer. Uh, just a few minutes behind. So what do I mean by metabolic power? So metabolism, the function of it is to do biological work. So in physics, work is the movement of matter over distance, accelerating matter over distance. The faster you move it, the greater the matter, the further the distance, the more work you're doing. And in physics, power is the rate of work. So when we look at, when we think about metabolic differences between say a reptile and a mammal, uh, I'm really interested in differences in metabolic power, the, the functional significance of these metabolic differences. And so metabolic rate is a useful proxy because ATP is powering all these biological work rates. But you can get more specific, especially where it makes functional sense. You can look at growth rates or movement rates, which I'll be doing. Uh, there's homeostatic and, and, and uh, rates occurring internally. There's a lot of things to look at, um, but I'll be focusing a lot on metabolic rate and, and, and movement and a little growth. So if I wanted to think about um, the role of metabolic variation, in life, it's good to take kind of two things on opposite sides of the spectrum. So we have ectotherms, which are most animals, their body temperature re reflects the environment. Uh, they have lower metabolic rates because they don't need to heat their bodies up as much. The body temperature is variable. 
unless the environment's constant. Um, and they don't need to eat much food because they're not producing all this heat that they need to keep a constant body temperature. So that's the good thing about the nectotherm, but the con is that your, your work rates are lower. You have slower movements, slower reaction times, growth rates, reproductive rates. And the endotherm is the opposite. They spend a lot of energy to keep a stable high body temperature. And they have to eat a lot, but they have all these higher metabolic power, all these higher uh, work rates. A key toggle on this difference is environmental temperature. So you take an ectotherm in a hot desert, and it's gonna have a much higher body temperature and much higher work rates, then you move down to a temperate system. And that difference will, uh, will lead to contrasting differences between endotherms and ectotherms. So we kind of had a, we want to have a global schematic of how temperature is modulating differences between these two groups. Endotherms that take their body temperature with them wherever they go should have relatively flat, constant uh, metabolic rates with temperature. Uh, you could think of land temperature as well. I kind of have marine stuff on my mind. This is true land and water. Now for a given species, it's gonna be variable. If it gets cold, it shivers, that produces heat. So when you actually get cold, you up your metabolic rate to maintain a constant temperature. If you're a lizard, and you heat up a lizard and you look at like a thermal performance curve, it'll get faster, it'll hit a peak and then drops off quite quickly. But in general, a lizard from a cold habitat that's adapted there will have lower rates than one from a warmer habitat. Um, and so we can kind of cross species, it's approximately straight lines. Within species, there's a little bit more curvature. And the significance of this ecologically is that the difference between these two has consequences. If you're a seal or a sea lion, you're trying to get a fish. It's easier to get a fish if it's slow. And the fishes are more slow in the cold. And if you're trying to avoid a shark, sharks are slower in the cold. So a lot of things become more favorable in the cold despite you know, thermal stress. And, and vice versa, if you're trying to chase a fish in the tropics, they get much faster, they're harder to catch. So maybe you switch to food that, you know, that doesn't move much, lobsters, whatever, but this creates an ecological challenge and you need special adaptations to deal with that. So in the first part, I wanna talk about how these metabolic differences are predicting competitive and trophic interactions. And I'll kind of briefly go through theory, which could you know, take a, a longer while to unpack. I kind of want to show you a lot of slides and I might run out of time. So I'll move through that and I'll focus on global patterns of diversity where we can get a wide temperature range. Temperature maps on to latitudinal diversity pretty well. So we get latitudinal diversity gradients uh, and see if these endotherms and ectotherms are acting very differently. And then I'm going to kind of move back into time. This is some of my PhD work and look at one of the dominant taxa of the time, which were dinosaurs, there's a kind of raging debate whether they're warm or cold-blooded. There was really three big debates, why they went extinct, what they're related to, and their thermal biology. And the first two have been settled, and that thermal biology is still debated. So um, I'll give you some, I'll make an argument on what I think about that. And then in my LEC work, I wanna kind of bring the focus a little bit closer to home. Um, communities are very interesting. This is where it plays out. Communities are also very difficult to test. There's so many variables, it's hard to generalize. Um, but I think we can apply a lot of this to communities, especially in forests, where we can get a lot of highly resolved data, track every individual, track every growth rate, mortality, et cetera. And then um, I'm gonna do some experiments where I manipulate temperature. I have a warm-blooded predator, which is a mouse and a cold-blooded prey, which are really cute cockroaches. They move really fast. Crickets would have been my first choice, but they hop, they're slow. So cockroaches are a good one, uh, even though nobody likes cockroaches. Okay, so let's go to the first part. Um, I want to kind of, lay out some ideas specifically that kind of build off this asymmetry model I showed you on how uh, competitive and predatory uh, interactions are affected by temperature between warm and cold-blooded. And 
to do that, I focus on the ocean because the ocean is really neat. You have a lot of different taxa with different thermal regulatory strategies. So you have marine birds, you have marine mammals. They're all eating cold-blooded fish or squid. So unlike on land where there's a lot of plants to eat uh, or you don't have large iguanas that are the size of buffalo that lions are attacking, you don't have um, too many large lizards that are chasing down antelope. Here you have a lot of cross thermal regulatory interactions. You have shark, cold-blooded sharks, large bony fish, the like groupers and barracuda, all these different uh, mammals and birds. And they're all almost all eating kind of cold-blooded prey. So it's a great system for looking at that. And they even eat each other depending on their size. So they, everybody starts small and you're more vulnerable for your competitor to actually eat you. So there's a lot of great interactions here where it's very strong negative interactions. And that kind of fits nicely into um, my framework and how to test it. There's also a really uh, neat group that are really prominent in the ocean, what I'm calling mesotherms. So um, unlike an ectotherm, they generate metabolic heat internally to raise their body temperature. So that's a lot like an endotherm. But unlike an endotherm, when they get cold, they don't boost their metabolic rate to keep a thermal set, a set point. So theirs will drop. It might drop 10 or 20 Celsius if they're diving to depth. So they're not really like an ectotherm, not really like an endotherm. Another difference is they all start small and they kind of match the ambient temperature like an ectotherm. But as they get bigger and there's less surface area, the volume, they change. And they are really important in the open ocean. So tuna, swordfish, we have th thresher sharks, mako sharks, great whites. Um, they're important ecological players, even if there aren't as many of them. So as I mentioned, there is this kind of metabolic calorie symmetry with temperature. I'm predicting more ecological success for endotherms in, when it's warm. Um, so let's see what's going on in the ocean. The first thing you'll see is kind of what should be familiar to many ecologists is a latitudinal diversity gradient. There are Tinsor, uh, who I later work with. Um, he had a nice kind of nature synthesis paper a few years back, and he looked at a lot of predictor variables. Uh, he has coral, he has fish, he's got cetaceans, pinnipeds, seals and sea lions, um, algae, some crustaceans, and you see this kind of tropical peak like you see on land. It's in coastal productive areas, kind of like a rainforest on land, and there's a lot in the Indo-Pacific where you have lots of islands, which probably is good for speciation. He looked at a lot of different predictor variables, including primary productivity. Sea surface temperature was the big predictor. Uh, and he kind of, he, uh, he found cetaceans fit this, but pinnipeds did not. So a hint that maybe endotherms are different. Cetaceans are mostly dominated by uh, two groups, dolphins, which work together as a team to herd, they're pretty unique. And then beaked whales, the second biggest, and they dive at cold depths so that we may be able to unpack the cetaceans more. So there could be a lot of reasons why diversity declines the poles. The poles are not connected. They may be more geologically unstable. There's less area at a temperature, et cetera. Um, but what I'm not is so interested in is in absolute diversity, but if things are interacting, I'm really interested in relative diversity. How many more endotherms are there compared to ectotherms? That's gonna shape food webs, community structure. And so what I did is I plotted the ratio of number of species in a gridded cell. I got all the species ranges from about, a th about almost a thousand species. These are large body, shallow water species. I, I gridded them and overlaid the ranges. This is an equal area plot. Every cell is 110 kilometers by 110 kilometers. And what you should see jump out is a clear latitudinal gradient where it gets redder, that's more endotherms towards the poles and bluer towards the tropics. So dark red is there's 16 times more mammals and birds than sharks and bony fish that are large, mind you. So things like groupers, barracudas, jacks, those are some of your um, cold-blooded fish, uh, as well as sharks. And uh, when it's dark, there's four times more ectotherms. I also throw in snake snakes to kind of add a little 
uh, segment. So you also see that there's a clear um, coastal to oceanic divide. But if you were to track what's going on along the coast there, South America, down, there's still a lot of thermal gradient happening, as well as the open ocean going down. Um, so if we were kind of to plot this data, there's a nice kind of parabolic function with temperature. What I did is I defined coastal species at 200 meters depth. Um, and oceanic is greater than, coastal is less than 200 meters, ocean is greater. So I separated those out and they're just offset. And there's a clear kind of parabolic function with latitude and then if you plot this by temperature, pretty linear function with coast, especially really high R squared, um, 0.86, 0.49 for oceanic. This is certainly qualitatively consistent with this idea that it's relatively easier for endotherms in the cold. Um, and one other thing about this is we're kind of, there are environmental features affecting both groups, they affect them equally, or we can kind of, we kind of implicitly control for that. So in the Mediterranean, there's a drop of diversity in kind of everybody, but the relative diversity doesn't change much for that latitude. So that's kind of relative patterns, absolute patterns of abundance in tooth whales and pinnipeds, which are well studied. They actually show a clear latitudinal gradient. So um, this is not just richness, but this is abundance and then consumption, which is how much food they're eating, and it's going to map onto abundance pretty clearly. You're just getting little different numbers um, because the more there are, the more they eat. Um, so we're getting clear kind of inverted latitudinal gradients in endotherms, which is really interesting in my opinion. I also collected a lot of data to show this metabolic asymmetry. So this is water temperature, this is burst speed, the fast you can go, this is kind of log transform scale. Uh, dolphins are faster than penguins, but pretty flat. Penguins and pinnipeds, pretty flat. And fish, this exponential one. And each one is kind of curving a bit, but if you put them together, uh, it goes up. And I have other things like saccadic eye rates and flicker fusion frequency, your ability to see things, cerebral firing rates, muscle contraction, routine swimming speed, acceleration. They all have this similar temperature dependence that generates this kind of asymmetry. So on a lot of dimensions, we're getting this. Um, here's the one I have to breeze through for time, but I wanted to build a model looking at the key components of foraging, like speed to encounter rate, to capture per encounter, capture rates the product of these two, and then to ecosystem consumption rate, where I'm arguing that as you're relatively better, the capture rate of an endotherm compared to an exotherm competitor is getting a higher fraction of prey production. So it's, it's like a, a logistic curve where you can only eat as many prey as available, but you can get more of them the better you are. And there's a temperature dependence to all of these, and the prediction I have, so the thermal sensitivity of metabolic rate of respiration is 0.65. This is kind of funny looking Boltzmann factor that people have taken from chemical kinetics. You know, you see the temperature, how fast do molecules bump into each other and form a bond. Um, in respiration, so they use this formulation in respiration, the value is 0.65 and kind of multiplying some of these. I predict the range between 0.65 and 1.3. So with capture efficiency, you can come up with behavioral processes to dampen the effects, so that can drop it below 1.3. But in between there is my prediction. Now I have consumption data for endotherm, so I can plug this in with the built-in temperature dependencies. I kind of get this little formula. I can put it in a kind of slope intercept form and the slope then uh, this is consumption divided by food availability. And I use primary production as a measure. Um, you know, it's about a hundred times lower than prey production, hundred thousand times lower than primary production, but it should be proportional roughly. And, and I looked at other factors as well, I'm using zoophyte production. Anyway, this slope here is 1.5, right? Between. So at least on this grand scale, um, after controlling for NPP, there's an 80 fold shift in consumption between endotherms and endotherms. So, 
That's really focusing on temperature, but we saw that kind of this coastal oceanic transition is important. Um, and there's a lot of things happening. You have a lot of interesting benthic habitat that's very close to surfaces in coastal systems. So you get high, you might be kind of slow and ectothermic, and it's okay because you're hiding, you don't have to be that fast. The water is more turbid from sediment and phytoplankton. So that also obscures you. But when you move out to the open ocean, it gets clear. And I'm just focusing on the upper part. It gets very clear, and there's no place to hide. And so speed and power should be at a premium. But organisms can adapt. They can have behavioral uh, options, uh, decisions. They can change their body plan in interesting ways. So, you know, a, a penguin is slow moving three meters a second, but a bird can fly much faster, very efficient space. And a gannet can plunge into the water at 24 meters a second. So maybe the fish isn't so fast and coming in that close. Especially if dolphins are hurting them up to the surface, and they can basically turn this into a churning bait ball, and suddenly the fish are individually moving fast, but um, just kind of stick your head in there and grab something. They're pretty easy to capture. We have a lot of tuna that go out into the open ocean, they're very fast. Uh, and then we have things like beak whales and sperm whales that can live in the tropics because they actually feed in cold depths. So we can explain kind of intra, intra thermal regulatory variation that people care about. If you're a whale lover, you don't just want to know what all whales are doing. You want to know what different ones are doing. And I use a similar metric. I took the ratio of, say, uh, penguins to seals. And if you do that, redder means more, um, more, I'm sorry, dolphins and seals. Redder is more dolphins, so the reddest is 16 times more dolphin species than pinnipeds. Um, and I think I have sea otters in there, another mammal that's solitary. It's just two species. Um, latitudinal gradient. And then as you get down here, there's eight times more seals and sea lions in, in the bluest area. And you can plot that. And it's slightly higher than this 0.65 restoration. <clears throat> Big shift, systematic shift. If I just look at coastal versus oceanic, you know, just to see if that how different those are, pretty similar shifts. So that's what that's what dolphins did. Um, seals, birds. So this is flying birds, guys, movies, petrels, terns, um, versus swimming birds. So these are Puffins, penguins, cormorants, grebes, and some grebes and loons that will hang out uh, in the winter um, hunting and same latitudinal gradient. Now, this white spot means that somebody is not there, and that somebody are penguins and puffins. And they can actually handle the open ocean if it's really cold, uh, although they're relatively near ice caps around here. Um, but, you know. There's some distance, but when it gets when it gets warm, they just form rinse and a few things come um, So they drop the zero here and ratio is 10A. Um, the birds are everywhere, the flying birds are everywhere. And we took a look at big whales. It's like I'm recycling these blocks, really similar. Um, and 0.69, that's very close to the middle box. So over and over, we're seeing if we can contrast things with different strategies that have different metabolic power, we see these latitudinal gradients. And this is with ocean depth as a proxy for openness. We have ectotherms that are more blue, mesotherms are purple, endotherms are red. And there's about an order of magnitude shift towards the relative diversity um, as you go from coastlines. And there's a lot here, and I just kind of lightened them so you can see where most of them are, You're kind of further out from sea um, in both cases. Finally, uh, you know, visibility is a big deal. So large animals are more visible. So my last prediction was that larger animals should be more endothermic. So imagine your predator prey interactions, whether you're prey or predator, you're easy to spot at a distance. Uh, in the ocean, often a great distance. Being able to flee quickly is important. Uh, so what happens when you get bigger, you get more high power endotherms and mesotherms. 
These are mostly baleen whales, but it's a clear trend. We have small birds even down here. Um, length was the metric I could get for a lot of the fish, but I could get mass for things on land. And you see the same general pattern. Now birds are pretty size constrained because they fly. Um, so they're in pink. These are mammals and tortoises. I'm not sure if I put crocodilians in there. Um, but general trend, and this is just mammals versus lizards, something kind of similar. Most mammals are just are rodents and bats, you know. So it's not even um, the case that this is where they're most common. But if you go up here, it really changes. And I bet if you looked in the tropics where you're a little faster, you can get bigger boids or crocodiles or something. Um, and in a temperate zone, those that's too dangerous. Unless you're a tortoise where you don't have to run away, you just use armor. So incidentally, tortoises follow Bergman's rule where they get bigger away and then lizards do not. Um, so I think we can tie in a lot of different patterns uh, to these species interactions and metabolic power. So kind of conclusions, these temperatures generate power symmetries. They predict the species outcomes consistent with global patterns and things like environmental features like visibility, openness matters, behavior matters. Um, we don't have to throw out all the fun details of different species in this kind of macroecological analysis. We can build them in to get a more realistic nuanced uh, understanding. So speaking of visibility and size, we go back in time, we had a lot of very visible dinosaurs that dominated the Mesozoic. This is here, and then this is uh, um, And people, I think I mentioned dinosaur paleontologists were really interested in why these things were so spectacular and so successful. Um, and we know why they went extinct. It was an asteroid. We know they're related to birds. Birds are a specialized dinosaur. Uh, we still are grappling with why they're successful. And a big focus has been the thermal biology, um, but it's been restricted. There's a lot of, for a long time, there was a lot of kind of categorical qualitative data. You look at bone histology, you slice it up and compare it to a turtle or a mammal. No, no one compared it to tuna or leatherback sea turtles, um, but they would make these comparisons. Um, nasal turbinates are great ways to recycle water. Endotherms have them, they look at that. Feathers certainly made a splash and they're mainly in predatory dinosaurs. Um, so that suggests higher metabolic rates. Their limbs are under themselves. They seem to be more active. So there's been a bit of a shift from overgrown reptile to active endotherm, but we didn't really have a lot of good data to test this until Greg Erickson, um, Got a lot of nice profile papers where he realized dinosaur bones were like tree rings. He slices them up as annual rings and you can age them. And then how big they are, it's like also like a tree. You can estimate biomass because we can do that in living animals. And with that data, you can get a growth curve. And both growth, growth curves for an individual is sigmoidal, it starts slow, it moves up, slows down. And that's same for pretty much every animal. Even if some of them don't often get there, they're still slowing down. Maybe they, like a fish often don't get there, but they're still following this curve. If you want to compare species, obviously there's different rates. You could pick the maximum rate right at this, where it goes from increasing to decreasing to decelerating. And then you can compare a lot of things. So people started to do this, but they use old data, comparative data that didn't control for temperature and ectotherms. Um, there are a lot of problems what I looked into in the data, and they never directly compared it to metabolic rates, which seems to be the most functionally significant thing. We know that metabolic rate increases with body mass, but it's about an order of magnitude more than that. Tropical ectotherm. Here's some data on the tropical ectotherm. Leave out the gray for the moment. Um, black are mesotherms. Uh, and so if this is true for growth rates, then we can do the same analysis for dinosaurs. And that's what I did on um, my PhD. Got a lot of dinosaurs, um, got a lot of growth rates. So each point might come from 20, 40, 
individual data points. Each point is a species. There's a lot of variability, variability that's interesting. We can look at how sexual birds and robins and different chickens and different mammals, but they're all above the ectotherms. Um, and the dinosaurs, there's a lot of big ones, they're kind of right in between. Like Archaeopteryx right there. Um, a lot of big size and sauropods are up here. And they're right along these mesothermic axis. Very interesting. So you can see in my title, what I kind of conclude. Um, I can link up metabolic rate to growth rate really nicely. On a log log plot, the slope tells you about how things are changing. So a slope of one, which is what I got, means you double something, you double the other. You increase tenfold, you increase tenfold. So more ATP is needed for, for uh, growth rate. This is what you'd expect. So it's a pretty good signal, and there is not a lot of differences between the two. It's not like endotherms are you know, higher than ectotherms. So this relationship should be good, so you can use growth rate to predict the metabolic rate in animals, uh, which is kind of amazing. Now, a lot of these plots, there's a big size effect. We can just pull out the effects of size, and you see it's this mass independent mass normalized metabolic rates mass normalized growth rate, and this upper quadrat, we get all the endotherms. There's some interesting patterns going on, big brain endotherms, they have long lifespans, grow slower, which are birds are really high, they can't run from predators, so the solutions are to grow really fast. Here are a bunch of cool mesotherms in the middle, and if we use this relationship to calculate dinosaur, they're kind of right here, mostly with the mesotherms. Um, stretching out. So my conclusion was many, most dinosaurs, maybe even the feathered ones, were mesotherms. So that's kind of, it seems like this high power strategy works and has been slowly selected for over evolutionary time as this capacity developed. Um, so what am I doing here? Uh, I'm really interested in taking some of these ideas and putting them in the lab. Um, say with not with shrews, they're a little hard to deal with, but with mice and cockroaches. Uh, we have our favorable hunting. Um, I'm also going to look at more community scales and we'll see if I can talk about it, what it's going to have in forests. And there's some applications to climate change in case you find all the theory stuff boring. Maybe species conservation does something for you. Okay, so we can just kind of recreate this plot on, you know, mice and shrews, or sorry, mice and roaches. In my second year, I want to apply this to lizards. Um, we're going to get brain activity in these guys, and be really cool to get brain activity in a lizard. The brain activity should be going up with temperature, uh, which I don't think anyone's shown, and be super cool if we can figure that out. But we know how to do it on mice. And so what I did is I set up a couple of thermally controlled chambers, very expensive system I had here. Uh, it's kind of hard to get one. A lot of the kind of, you know, um, the chambers that look like a, like a refrigerator, they don't have the good temperature range. Uh, they can't fit a lot of things in. And then Tony Dell from NGREC, one of my kind of mentors, um, He's got an awesome $10,000 system that I tried to break one time, uh, but we don't have the mice there and the neural setup. So we kind of did our own. For every chamber, we had four arenas, four high-tech arenas, and this is what it looks like inside. We got a mouse, we got a roach, um, and the man kind of directing all this, my sidekick, PhD student Jacob, Jacob Amy. So it's right here, great mustache, great guy. I want to give him credit. Um, here's what it kind of looks like. So this is at room temperature, I believe. The roaches are pretty fast at room temperature. Um, the mice know as soon as we enter, the food's coming. It's coming down a little PVC tube. Um, and so it's getting excited. Oh, there's the roach. So they're super motivated. Oh, lost it for a second, where did it go? All over it. So there's data that they learn visual, you know, visual tracking. 
Um, and we can quantify all these different patterns of movement, how far they are from each other, how long it takes, distance traveled, um, other patterns of movement. So that's exciting. There's a lot of, um, they actually learn to hunt pretty rapidly. So this is time to capture. They start off taking, I don't know, six minutes or something, five minutes. Uh, and then pretty quickly it comes right down to like 10 seconds at room temperature, graze room temperature. You run this for a week, and then a week at cooler temperatures, the bluer it gets, the colder, 13, 18 Celsius, 30, 35 Celsius. Wasn't a big difference there, but um, back and forth. And then we had one where we did a day, uh, each one was a day. Um, and in a lot of experiments in neuroscience, looking at behavior, mice, pressing levers, it might take thousands of trials to get to this graph until where they really figured out and came in. But thousands, and this is like 24, and this is an ecologically, or ecologically, as they like to say, complex behavior. You could imagine using models where, you know, of people where you have learning deficits and trouble learning, and this would be a good test, or maybe behavioral motor skills are impacted, and you could, you could use this kind of setup um, to test brain function. You could, you know, tweak the brain and see how they respond. So it's, I think, so Keith Hengen, the neuroscientist, uh, he is excited about this behaviorally, and I'm glad because I haven't done any neuroscience yet. But I've been here for a few months in my LEC, and I kind of got started a little, little bit earlier to get results. So let's think about what we're going to see. There's this basic asymmetry. We know that actually at some point the roaches will stop running fast. Um, their maximum speeds will be higher than the routine speeds. Um, and it, you know, if the mouse is actually tracking the roach, it will probably speed up a little bit too. So kind of something I didn't think about originally in my marine one, but that's the beauty of this stuff. You can add complexity, but it's speed of increase will be shallower. So a lower slope. Incidentally, this is about 2.5 fold increase per 10 Celsius. You wanna know what that number means. So here's what we find. This is the roach speed on the left. Pretty close to a uh, metabolic theory prediction. Uh, it goes up. I fit a, a kind of a spline loss curve that pretty much fits exactly what it is. And then a linear fit um, is close. And really clear pattern. You'll notice that not only is the average going up, but like the higher quantiles are also increasing. With the mice, they're definitely going up, uh, although it doesn't fit right. Um, but they're going up here, and you notice the upper quantiles are pretty flat, getting at that physiological constancy. Um, so that fits. The time to capture at ecological rates is indeed going up. Um, kind of levels off up here, which is kind of interesting. We're thinking about what that means. We're we'll just getting a little bit faster up here, but not a ton. So part of it's that. But there may be additional constraints where you have to learn to be better up here. But you see this nice pattern, and if you kind of subtract the roach speed, temperature appendix from the mouth, or the mouse from the roach, you get close to what we're seeing up here, about 0.5. Also near the 0.65. And then distance travel, uh, roaches run a lot more, you know, so speed is distance over time, distance is speed times time. So these slopes are going up more. And so this is under 10 to over 120 Celsius uh, range, that's a lot. Uh, and there's a similar pattern, but it's more modest. It would look more dramatic if I kind of cut it off here, but I wanted to show you the same scale to emphasize the contrast. So I mentioned that there's this learning, they learn how to hunt. Are they learning just to track something and it's moving fast, so they track it faster? Or are they actually taking temperature as a direct cue? Um, and so uh, we did some experiments where we had a cold roach in a cold chamber. This is what you expect, hot roach in a hot chamber. But what if we threw a cold roach, which is easy to capture in a hot chamber, we doesn't expect it. It turns out we might have more data that uh, it takes longer to figure out that this is behaving differently. And there's some anecdotal data that when it's really hot, 
they kind of sit back and are checking out where this thing goes to and reacting a little bit of a delay. Whereas when it's cold, it's easy money, just go grab it. Um, so it kind of threw it off. And uh, so I'm going to apply some of this because I'm kind of macro at heart to another small mammal predator that eats things. Those are shrews. And they have this almost global distribution, 414 species, a lot to work with. Um, a lot of metabolic variation. We've got like 20 some data points on there. And what I expect to see is that you can kind of see this here. This is slower metabolic rate, hence the purple color, more tropical. Um, and then even these guys that didn't, you know, they didn't make it over here. The red tooth shrews with iron in the teeth that makes them reddish, they mostly have hugged mountain tops, you know, uh, when they make it in the tops. Despite there being quite a lot of food, you know, running around at night in the bottom of the rainforest. So that's interesting. Um, again, it's harder to eat. They have high metabolic rates and eat a lot. These guys undergo torpor so they can save energy during the day uh, and then get the food. And if I were to take the average metabolic rate policy, I expect to see a lateral rate, gradient and metabolic rate. So these are some of the things I'm working on, will be working on as I'm here. Um, just to show you how common this pattern is, this is on land, mammals and lizards. Not all of them are competing, but a lot of them are eating each other and some are not competing because they got killed. So in the Permian, you have uh, iguana-sized reptiles that ate vegetation and were prey. I don't think an iguana would last in the Serengeti. So we see these pretty powerful gradients. Australia is a little bit weird. A lot of lizards. Um, maybe the mammals aren't a good competition, uh, but pretty strong pattern. This is the slope of metabolic rate. So temperature adjusted differences in metabolic rates. This is shaping diversity. And from a conservation perspective, as we warm up the globe, we're shifting things in this direction where mammals should be getting relatively less diverse. And we know not just diverse, less abundant, eating less of the food. So the community composition food should be changing. As I mentioned, we might cut it short on plants, but I want to look at something. <laughs> You can't look at in a local community, you know, where a naturalist goes out and actually feels a one with nature and can look around and see things. It's hard to get a sense of what all the reptiles and mammals are doing. It, it's a lot of work just to take one species and get its abundance and distribution. But with trees and like long-term monitoring stations, like we have at Tyson, we can track every individual over a centimeter diameter breast height. We can measure them every five years, see how much they've grown, see if they died. We can estimate light coming in based on their size uh, and position, or maybe we can actually measure that with LIDAR and things. Um, so it's our chance to integrate traits, resources, abundance, productivity, all these things that matter. And there are some kind of high power trees and low power trees. So a lot of your kind of fast growing pioneers, that's appropriate in Panama, they have high nitrogen phosphate in the leaves, which supports high assimilation respiration rates. They don't like the shade because they can't really pay the bills. They're not getting enough light. The respiration is a kind of deficit. Uh, and they do good in gaps and in the canopy. And these shade tolerant ones, they're more climax or late successional ones, very shade tolerant. Um, and it seems like an obvious way that you might Partition niche, and we have a lot of resource variations. So, two orders of magnitude or more um, of light variability from tree to tree, depending if you're in the canopy, if you're in a gap or not. And so, this kind of growth mortality trade off, it's kind of like a fast, slow trade off live fast, die young, live slow, die old. And it's an obvious thing that you might expect to be driving kind of niche diversity in local composition. Um, but if you look at the relative abundance and relative richness, I'm glad that Hubble decided this is also a good metric. Um, you might expect that there's, oh, there's more individuals in a gap of everybody, but there should be relatively more of the gap species. And he didn't find that. 
So in Panama, not La Selva, Costa Rica, these are two primary rainforests. No one is smoking that. It's a pretty interesting, but my critique is that we know that basically as trees get bigger, they're growing more, uh, but their abundance is dropping at a similar rate. So when you're looking at patterns of abundance or richness, you're mainly looking at the little balance. And those must be the most vulnerable to, to stochastic recruitment limitation. Maybe like 2% of the seeds that represent all the species are in a given uh, gap. And so, and then some are established, there's a lot of chance. But light is systematically increasing from 2% or so at the bottom to full light at the top. And so there is niche partitioning of light, we should see it over the full range. So we don't want to look at individual counts. We might want to look at uh, uh, slopes. And I should mention, you multiply these together, you get production per side plots. If it's flat, it's been called energy equivalence, it means for respiration per side plots. And that's kind of a measure of energy flux and leads to its competition. So we can use some of these basic metrics to get at a lot of interesting things with competition. I would predict these fast shady tolerant ones a little more suppressed in terms of their growth. I so especially with abundance, they should be rarer, but then as they get more light systematically, they uh, become relatively abundant. They should violate this energy equivalence, which is a macroecological average we've seen individual forests vary. Um, but then these slow ones should be different. You probably hug, hug the predictions more because they're more common. And so what I'm doing is add a few more life histories. There's also long-lived pioneers as well as the short-lived pioneers. Uh, I'm expecting them to have different slopes. Um, and we can put that together to get this ratio. And I expect a shift from mostly shaitan and gas, especially shaitan and slow species at the bottom towards pioneers and gas specialists, long pioneers at the top. Looking at abundance, looking at productivity, looking at richness, key variables, getting a compositional change within a community. Um, and I actually have some data supporting that, but save that for another time. Uh, here's some preliminary data. You can see this is relative abundance, the PCI. Every, this is a species, everything is species. This is a PCA, a lot of traits that relate to the growth mortality trade off. You go this way, you grow fast and you die quickly. That way, you grow slowly, you live a long time. And then things in the middle don't really fit that. These grow fast, die slowly, but they recruit poorly. They get big, these stay small, they grow slowly, they die easily, but they recruit them. And what you see is that this, they're, they're little, so they should shrink, but these guys, really common in the understory, and progressively decline. Um, now, other things can scale the size, doesn't have to be light. Humidity changes, that affects pathogens. You can have density dependent James and Connell stuff happening, lightning, wind flow. Um, but I think this size thing is really important because a lot of things change. Um, and so we should get maybe a different map of community ecology that links to these energetic traits and resource variation that you know, is tied closely to classic literature and community ecology and forests. And so with that, I didn't race through it too much. Uh, some various collaborators, Hengen Lab, Jacob, you've seen here, Tony Dow, and some other people I've worked with over the years. Uh, thank you. I'll take a question. Do we have questions? In the back? If you could wait for the microphone. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, you mentioned that there was sort of three with the dinosaurs in your science paper. Yeah. Was that the science paper? Is the dinosaur one? Yeah, that was it. Um, you mentioned that there were three, used to be three questions about dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, the second one being what they're related to. Yeah. And then the third was sort of what class they're in. Yeah, the third, the third class. Yeah, the thermal biology. Yeah. Yeah. How do you live? I guess, you know, you mentioned that um, 
you know, we sort of figured out what they're related to. My question is, is there thermal biology class, I think there's a surprise with what they're related to phylogenetically. I because I would have thought that like once the phyl phylogenetics is involved or the relationships are resolved, that gives a lot of clues about you know what thermal class is made. So yeah, is it a unique are they unique? no, I think so. They have this descendant lineage of this specialized uh, dinosaur birds. And it turns out birds in the Mesozoa grew very slowly. So there's probably an escalation in metabolic rates. Um, but their ancestors were probably ectothermic. So, you know, you look at different parts of the tree, you get it. And I think you can't presume that this descendant or specialized play, you know, uh, predicts what all these other relatives going, especially when you have a basal state of ectothermic. And I'll just mention this approach I use should also be relevant for pterosaurs, for a lot of marine. Uh, I predict a lot of the marine uh, elasmosaurs, mosasaurs would be mes mesothermic. And I have ideas how to test that further, but, but yeah, it's a good question. People have asked that um, and the response is usually what I say. Other questions? James. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. That's okay. Please. Why are there not more mesoterms? And the ones that are extant today, am I right in thinking they're all marine? In my paper, I argued the uh, echidna was a mesotherm. Okay. Um, not quite the same. So you can imagine starting off as an ectotherm and you're trying to push your performance up, up, up. Um, there's only a handful of ectotherms in the open ocean, period. Like five species that are active predators. Uh, there's like the mahi mahi, wahoo, maybe a bluefish. Very rare. There's a lot more mesotherms. Um, so they're kind of starting from an ectothermic state pushing up, whereas the echidna, maybe sloths and a few others are kind of starting one way and working down because they don't need to expend that much energy. Um, but I think on land, there's a lot of interactions of these endotherms that are not limited by how much they breathe. They can be small, they can be ambush hunters. And I bet a lot of ones in between got squeezed. So for instance, marsupials, Good endotherms, lower metabolic rate. Monotremes, some of them anyway, are endotherms, lower metabolic rate. And what happens with this long evolution with placental mammals and these other traits that are different, of course, they've kind of been squeezed out in a lot of places. Um, and so they're more in cryptic you know, situations, there's a lot of trees. So I think there's been more intense interactions at all these different levels. Um, the ability to have gills forge deeply, do other things, give more room for mesothermic animals. Um, but the escalation that's happened on land vertebrates probably allowed for um, a lot of the potential mesotherms to not be selected for, or not to evolve or to be selected against. Now, maybe dinosaurs, because they're so big, will occupy a new niche space, confect of mesotherms, and you could get interesting coexistence. But um, because of strong predator prey interactions, that's my guess. Good question. Awesome. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Anybody else? T Bone. Is there any reason, or can you make a prior prediction about why endotherms have? Maybe that's the message, but at the temperature that they're at, like, it's like, yeah. it's like, is it better to be hotter or is it only biochemical? So I think there's two big constraints. One is phylogenetic. Uh, if you just turn up your ATP production, but you're not doing anything with it, your work rates aren't necessarily increasing by temperature to go up your work. Uh, and then it takes machinery to get to that point and then to integrate it into your system. If you had a mutation where you just had a higher metabolic rate, but you didn't, Know how to use it that could get knocked back but what you see in a lot of the really active ones like birds pastorines are like 42 celsius um super active it pays to be able to fly all over the place um a lot of the sloths have lower metabolic rates armadillos have lower metabolic rates marsupials so there's a narrow range um i think there's phylogenetic constraints and then uh 
and then it's kind of a slow push to push that ceiling up. Um, would be my guess, but certainly some tax have done it, and the more it pays off, the more the selective pressure is for that. But you have to pay the bill of having a high metabolism, and so maybe birds with their ability to move really quickly, efficiently over space, get a lot of food, can pay that bill more easily than mammals. Pretty talk, John. We have a question here from YouTube um, from Jonathan Wilson. Oh. He says, I get that endothermic predators have a big advantage in locomotory speed over, end, over ectothermic prey in cold places, but endothermy also costs a lot more. Staying warm is expensive in cold places. I'm guessing that's involved in your calculation somewhere, but I didn't see it in your equation. Could you explain? Yeah, so I've tried to look at how much it actually costs to live in a colder place. And it's like maybe a 20% increase uh, in metabolic rate. So when you move to the cold as an endotherm, you don't just boost your metabolic rate, you pack on more fat, you have denser kind of insulation. And that is a relatively cost-free. So having fur doesn't have that metabolic rate. Fat's very low. Uh, those fat cells are mostly just lipids, not using energy. So you can reduce a lot of that potential cost just by changing, you know, your insulation. <laughs> Some of them is wrenches rules. You get a little narrow. Uh, your your limbs aren't go out. You reduce surface area. You know, a hair might reduce the length of its ears. Um, and so there are some increases, but they're relatively modest. And you know, you have uh, a heart seal in the ocean, and and minus one Celsius. Minus five, it's not boosting its metabolic rate. It's it's at its basal metabolic rate. Um, and it's only modestly higher than a tropical one. Yeah. Was there another part to that? I just want to remember. I think, I think you covered it. All right. Thank you. One more question. Thanks. Um, I have a question about the, your approach towards constructing these global patterns of species richness. Um, and I was wondering to what degree you took into account variation in latitudinal range size. Because the Rathaport's rule, I would expect, applies at least to some end of the terms, you know, probably to others, yeah. which is well. Um, but the, the idea that latitudinal range size increases the value with latitude. So that itself can be used. Do you think that could be a plausible novel model to uh, can begin assessing the role of functional traits? So it does, we see that certainly on land with mammals, uh, as well as reptiles. Imagine if it happens with equal amounts, then taking that ratio basically cancels that effect. Um, so it's still useful for kind of, or if they differ, it kind of draws out that effect. Um, in the ocean, a lot of things have big ranges, especially the mammals. So you probably have smaller ranges in ectotherms, especially in the tropics. Um, so if we're looking at why absolute diversity is different, I think you could probably try to bake that in and could be useful for thinking about mechanisms, I suppose. But we see this on land and in the ocean, and a lot of land mammals have small ranges in the tropics. Um, so I don't think it would explain it, but if you could quantify it, you could put it in and see what its explanatory power is. Um, that might be interesting to go. To finish us out, we have a brief follow-up from Jonathan. He says, yes, but what about compared to ectothermic predators? They might not catch as many prey, but they don't need these predators. Yeah, so... The issue is, is there going to be a systematic shift with temperature? Um, and so, yes, in the cold ones, they really don't need to catch very many at all, but they get very vulnerable. And so, like, all your, your large snakes are all in the tropics, and they incidentally are very close to the ground. So I think you have to think about how much the benefits are changing relative to costs and how that cost-benefit ratio is changing the temperature. And what I'm arguing is that asymmetry, at least in a system with a lot of strong antagonist interactions, ultimately favors the endotherms. But if you can be a deep sea fish or whatever, 
and get away from a lot of those. Um, or you can be fossorial, or you can be small and really cryptic. There's a lot of ways to have a low power existence and to do really well. You just don't want to be big and exposed and vulnerable, and then you're really narrow. Um, and so it's not that you can't coexist, but your ability to coexist and have many different forms coexisting is changing as this relationship changes with them. Thank you, Dr. Grady, for joining us and speaking today. And just a reminder that we will be meeting outside of Bayer. So if you have more questions, you can bother him uh, at our reception. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.